welcome to Plug Live Television. One of the biggest topics on people's minds at the moment is the cost of electricity. Along with petrol, diesel and gas, electricity prices have gone through the roof in the last few months. So today what we'll do is we'll have a look at how the electricity market is structured, what's caused these price rises and what you can do to try and lower your bills. Domestic electricity prices are driven by the wholesale electricity price. The wholesale electricity price is determined by supply versus demand. At a given time, there'll be a certain demand that has to be met with supply from various generators connected to the national grid, including wind farms, nuclear power plants and so on. These generators bid to meet the demand with a certain number of gigawatts of power for a given price per unit of electricity, or kilowatt hour, provided to the grid. The cheapest generator is added to the supply mix at their named price, followed by the next cheapest generator with their named price, and so on, until all demand is met. Such is the way that the wholesale electricity market works. The wholesale price of electricity is set by the marginal plant. That's the generator that fills the last bit of grid demand at the most expensive price. In this scenario, even although some generators have offered to provide electricity at 5 pence per kilowatt hour, everyone gets paid the most expensive price of 30 pence per kilowatt hour. Well, technically the wholesalers of that electricity will get paid 30 pence per kilowatt hour. Any generators who've signed long-term power purchase agreements with wholesalers which guarantee a set price per kilowatt hour for all of the electricity produced over the lifespan of the generator in question, will receive whatever price was agreed in the PPA. This is common for generators with high capital expenditure and low operating costs, like onshore wind farms and solar farms. The wholesale price is determined every 30 minutes, reflecting changes in grid demand and the cost and quantity of electricity from different generators. Generally speaking, this means that electricity is more expensive at peak times, such as in the evening when everyone's cooking dinner and high demand is met using fossil fuel peaking plants, and it's cheaper overnight when demand is low and there's a lot of excess renewable energy available. To determine your household electricity tariff, your electricity supplier averages out the predicted wholesale cost of electricity for the next few months or years, then adds on a profit margin to reach the price that you pay for each kilowatt hour of electricity. Note that your supplier will likely pay a higher price than your tariff to supply you with electricity at peak times, but they make up for this loss with a profit during off-peak times. Your standing charge, which is the daily charge that you pay regardless of how much electricity you use, is made up of grid transmission and distribution charges, the green levy, and the cost of recovery associated with energy providers that have gone bust. Since so many smaller suppliers went bust recently, owing to them having profit margins that were just big enough to hedge against seasonal variances in wholesale electricity prices, but nowhere near big enough to hedge against large external factors that have driven wholesale electricity prices upwards today, your standing charge is likely much higher than it was a few months ago. Since wholesale electricity prices are so high, the price at which electricity providers can sell you electricity has also had to increase to stop them all from going out of business. Wholesale prices are so high at the moment that something interesting is happening with some forms of electricity generation that were previously deemed expensive. Some generators, like offshore wind farms and the upcoming Hinkley Point C nuclear power plant, supply electricity on a contract for difference. This guarantees a minimum strike price for the electricity that they provide to the national grid. If the wholesale price is less than the strike price, then the generator is paid the difference. In the above example, if the wholesale electricity price was 11 pence per kilowatt hour, then the offshore wind farm would be paid an extra 2 pence per kilowatt hour to make up the difference. However, in contracts for difference, if the wholesale electricity price is higher than the strike price, then the generator must pay back the difference in cost. In the above scenario, since the wholesale price is 30 pence per kilowatt hour, then the offshore wind farm must pay back 17 pence per kilowatt hour of electricity that it provides to the grid. This is currently happening with many renewables. In fact, it's estimated that wind farms will pay back 660 million pounds between October 2021 and April 2023 under contracts for difference. So, renewables are actively lowering electricity prices today. Imagine how expensive electricity would be without them. However, the biggest cost driver for wholesale electricity prices today is the wholesale gas price. The wholesale gas price is set on a global scale, so it's vulnerable to fluctuations in output and supply from major producers. A couple of solutions have been touted by some recently to reduce UK gas prices. The first is to ramp up production in the North Sea, but this wouldn't work because gas prices are set on a global scale. The second is to start fracking, but again, this wouldn't work because gas prices are set on a global scale, 
and the output from the North Sea or fracking wouldn't be anywhere near enough to influence global supply and prices. Besides, UK shale reserves are not physically feasible to extract. Such is the type of rock in which pockets of gas are contained that vast amounts of energy, chemicals and effort are required to perform a fracking operation that ultimately returns a tiny amount of gas per fracture. Rather than being a piñata full of sweets, it's akin to karate chopping a giant breeze block to release one smarty trapped within it. It's simply not worth the hassle. On top of that, fracking brings with it groundwater contamination and earth-cancelling impact on climate change through methane leaks and CO2 from gas that's subsequently burned. Plus the excessively long time that it would take to set up fracking operations or to ramp up North Sea production would be of no use to us today or even next year. But back to pure economics, prolonging or increasing our dependence on gas will only make electricity prices worse. The UK is a net importer of gas, so if it decided to isolate itself from the global gas market and set its own price for UK gas for UK consumption, there wouldn't be enough gas to go around. Forced to look for gas from overseas, the UK would be back to paying for gas at the wholesale price set on a global scale. If you want cheaper electricity, ditch gas. Of course, that requires the government to step in and do something about it. But what can you do to reduce your electricity bills today? One of the most promising options I've seen is Ripple Energy, which lets you buy a small part of a wind farm. The way it works is you buy a given number of watts of its total capacity, and the electricity that it produces is sleeved to you via the national grid. This means that it bypasses the wholesale electricity market, avoiding high electricity prices and saving you money. Grid transmission charges still apply. Each month, a discount is applied to your electricity bill for each kilowatt hour of electricity that your share of the wind farm produced. This is worked out by subtracting the low, stable cost of the wind farm's electricity from the wholesale electricity price at the time. This makes Ripple an even more attractive proposition whilst wholesale electricity prices are so high. The discount is applied to your bill for all of the electricity that your share of the wind farm produced, even if you didn't use that much electricity in your house. Ripple's share offer on their next wind farm at Kirkhill in Scotland closes on the 3rd of May and it's expected to be online by the end of 2023. I've bought a share in this wind farm and you can use my Ripple referral code to get a £25 reward. I'll post the link underneath this video too. Note that you need to be a customer of Co-op Energy, Octopus Energy or So Energy to apply Ripple to your bill, although more suppliers are expected to be added soon. I've been a very happy customer of Octopus for a while now and again I've got a referral code that you can use when switching to get £50 of credit on your account. One of the neatest advantages of Ripple is that if you can't have solar panels installed on your house, you can still own a share of this wind farm and benefit from the clean electricity that it produces. Plus, if you move house, you can take your wind farm share with you. If you don't have the cash up front for a wind farm investment, you can still save money by switching to an off-peak, time-of-use electricity tariff. This takes advantage of wholesale electricity being cheaper overnight than during the day. Since there's less demand, more renewables and less fossil fuels on the grid, electricity is typically much cheaper at night, which means that your supplier can sell you cheaper electricity at certain hours. The biggest example is Octopus Go, which at the time of making this episode provides 4 hours of electricity at 7.5 pence per kilowatt hour overnight, versus over 30 pence per kilowatt hour during the day. If you're able to shift your electricity use away from the evening peak to overnight, you'll be rewarded with a cheaper tariff. This is perfect for charging your car, running your heat pump to heat up the hot water tank, running the dishwasher and so on. You could potentially save hundreds of pounds each year. All you need is a smart meter so that the time that you use the electricity can be logged so you get your discounted off-peak tariff applied to it. A normal dumb meter doesn't log this so there's no way of being able to tell how much electricity was used during the off-peak period. Note that the new SMETS 2 smart meters that are being installed today are much better than the old ones that had issues like being locked to a specific electricity supplier. I got my SMETS 2 smart meter installed last year and I'm very happy with it. More electricity suppliers are starting to provide off-peak tariffs now, but Octopus is one of the first to do so and has several time-of-use tariffs, like Go, to choose from depending on your needs. Again, you can use my referral code if you switch to Octopus to get £50 credit on your account. I'll post the link underneath this video. So, off-peak tariffs have no upfront cost and can provide instant savings versus a single-price, flat-rate electricity tariff. Another option that can knock lumps off of your bills is solar panels. The cost of solar panels has plummeted over the past decade and VAT on solar panels is now 0% in the UK. A 4 kilowatt peak array typically costs around £5,000 installed, although that figure could potentially be less. The output of solar panels is surprisingly impressive, 
when I got my solar panels installed, I expected them to produce 3000 kilowatt hours in their first year of operation. And without a household energy storage system, I expected most of that to be exported to the grid. However, my solar panels produced 4000 kilowatt hours in their first year, and through careful timing of car charging, heat pump hot water top ups, and doing the laundry, 77% of that output was used in my house. Today's higher electricity prices mean that the payback period for solar panels is even faster. By dividing the installed cost of the solar panels by the cost of a kilowatt hour of electricity from a new flat rate tariff today, I've said 30 pence per kilowatt hour but that's actually on the low end of pricing at the moment, we find that the solar panels have paid for themselves within about 5 years, after which you're laughing your way to the bank over the estimated 25 year lifespan of the panels. Admittedly, there will be some loss in efficiency as the panels age, but I estimate that my setup will produce 88,000 kilowatt hours of electricity over 25 years, of which 68,200 kilowatt hours will be used in my house. Dividing the installed cost of the solar panels by the number of kilowatt hours of electricity produced by them that I actually use in my house, we find that the electricity from my solar panels will work out to me at 7.3 pence per kilowatt hour which is less than a quarter of a new flat rate electricity tariff today and less than half of the cost of home electricity before prices went mad. On top of this, solar panel owners can be paid for electricity that they export via the Smart Export Guarantee, so the electricity that I exported has been bought by my electricity supplier. Over the lifespan of the solar panels, even assuming the fairly rubbish export price that I currently get for my solar electricity, I estimate that my solar panels will earn me £600 in electricity exports. If you don't have the cash up front for solar panels, look out for financial incentives, such as the Home Energy Scotland interest free loan for solar panels. A very effective option to reduce electricity bills is insulation. It may not be cool or as interesting as solar panels, but if you have an electrically powered heating system, then one of the best ways to reduce electricity bills is to reduce the amount of electricity that you need in the first place. This is especially true of the UK's notoriously drafty housing stock. As shown in excellent analysis by Carbon Brief, insulation efforts in the UK came under attack in 2013, when the government scrapped successful incentives to insulate homes, resulting in a crash in the amount of insulation being installed. This, combined with an effective ban on new onshore wind in England, amounted to David Cameron's cutting the green crap, which has been calculated to have cost UK households £2.5 billion pounds in increased bills due to the subsequent reduction in low carbon, low cost, and efficiency boosting measures. If you want to save money on your heating bills, loft insulation is a good place to start, as is double or triple glazing. Even if you have the latter in the first place, check to see if the windows are drafty. Secondary glazing film that you hair dry onto the window is actually surprisingly effective for draft proofing too. Cavity walls and solid walls can both be insulated, with the latter having internal or external insulation options. Insulation underneath ground floors helps to prevent drafts coming into the house, and pipe insulation and radiator reflector panels ensure that more heat is delivered to where it's needed and not lost along the way. There's lots more advice on insulation from the Energy Saving Trust, and if you live in Scotland, Home Energy Scotland has interest-free loans available for people installing a plethora of different types of insulation, some examples of which are listed here. Finally, domestic electricity bills can be reduced by reducing wholesale electricity prices. The more that politicians realise that electricity bills are a major issue for the electorate, the more likely they are to act on them. Write to your MP and ask them to support measures such as ditching gas-fired electricity. A determined switch to renewables and storage, including wind, solar, numerous battery chemistries and novel energy storage technologies like Highview Power's cryogenic air and Cheesecake Energy's thermal and compressed air systems will quickly reduce the amount of gas required for electricity generation whilst creating thousands of skilled jobs. Many renewable energy and storage technologies can be deployed in weeks. Owing to its much lower efficiency, and therefore much less energy out versus energy in, hydrogen should only be used as a last resort for storage. Another measure to support is the reforming of the wholesale electricity market so that the price isn't set by the highest bidder. This one will be trickier to achieve as there are some generators whose business model is built around the market today. The top prize will go to whoever can figure out a way to reform the electricity market so that electricity becomes cheaper whilst protecting those generators who rely on the old model to stay afloat. A big win for electricity bills would be a windfall tax on oil and gas, since the cost of extracting gas from the North Sea hasn't gone up, but wholesale gas prices definitely have, with oil and gas companies enjoying a huge surge in profits as a result. Finally, 
press your MP to undo the damage done by David Cameron's cutting the green crap back in 2013. Reintroduce ambitious grants, let alone loans, for insulation, and mandate that all new and renovated buildings should be built to world-leading standards of insulation, with heat pumps providing heating and hot water, and solar panels covering the entire roof. Undoing the damage of 2013 would also see planning regulations changed in England so that they are no longer hostile towards onshore wind, which is the cheapest form of electricity generation and is consistently very popular in polls, making it a win-win for reducing electricity prices. So there we are, I hope you found that useful, I hope you found that insightful and that some of those electricity bill cutting measures are going to be accessible to you and useful for you. I'm aware that some of them require a bit of cash up front, of course, but there's others which potentially can be done for free. So fingers crossed you can get as much of that done as possible and it actually does work for you. Uh, in addition to that, there's a couple of other cool bits and pieces to, to throw in uh, which might be of use. If you have a gas combi boiler, one of the recommendations is to reduce the flow temperature to 55 degrees C. It's estimated that you can save 8% of your gas bill if you reduce the flow temperature. Note, do not do that if you have a boiler that has a hot water tank because you need the hot water to be stored at a given temperature to avoid Legionnaire's disease. But for combi boilers, it's completely fine to do and it's recommended to, to give that a go. You can also cut your carbon intensity because the National Grid has a fantastic app called When to Plug In. This isn't necessarily going to save you money, but it's going to show you where your electricity is coming from right down to the region of the National Grid that your house lies within. So for example, I'm in southern Scotland, which is one of the cleanest parts of the national grid because we get most of our electricity from wind farms and the rest tend to come from nuclear. But that said, there's some more carbon intensive parts of the UK. I'm thinking South Wales, East Midlands, they're quite bad for it. And then there's some that are kind of yo-yo dieters. You've got West Midlands, which can be incredibly clean, likewise with the South West, but then sometimes they really ramp up their fossil fuel generation. So if you have a look at the carbon intensity and where all of your electricity is coming from via this app, you can then choose, as it says in the name, when to plug in so that you can reduce the CO2 emissions associated with your electricity use. And on a completely separate note, uh, something that may be of interest to some of you, I am going to be chairing a series of webinars for the FASTER project, which is installing 73 much needed electric vehicle DC rapid chargers in the west of Scotland, in Northern Ireland and in the Republic of Ireland. And as part of this, they're doing a webinar series on electric vehicles. There'll be panel sessions uh, that I'll be chairing everything from a basic introduction to electric vehicles, what they are, how you charge them, how you maintain them, etc all the way to the kind of nitty gritty of how the different charging networks are run in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland. And we'll be asking some of the big questions on that. And I know that some EV drivers who watch this will be particularly interested to find out more about that. So um, yeah, the first webinar is on the 20th of April and it's an introduction to charging electric vehicles at home, workplace or in public. But that said, there's also going to be information about incentives and grants available for installing all of those kinds of infrastructure. So even if you're you know, very well versed in what an electric vehicle is and how to plug it in, there could be some useful information for you. And finally, I will be on a couple of panel sessions at Fully Charged Live in Farnborough. That's 29th of April to the 1st of May. I hope to see you there. Thanks again. See you soon for another episode of Plug Live Television.